Society as drama. If the attempt at communication in the preceding two chapters has been successful, the reader may now have a sensation that could perhaps be described as sociological claustrophobia. He can be considered a certain moral right to demand some relief for this from the writer in the way of an affirmation of human freedom in the face of the various social determinants. Such as affirmation, however, possess a priori difficulties within the framework of sociological argument. It will be necessary to look at these difficulties briefly before we proceed. Freedom is not empirically available. Most precisely, while freedom may be experienced, experienced by us as a certainty along with other empirical certainties, it is not open to demonstration by any scientific methods. If we wish to follow Kant, freedom is also not available rationally that is, cannot be demonstrated by philosophical methods based on the operations of pure reason. Remaining here with the question of empirical availability, the elusiveness of freedom with regard to scientific comprehension does not lie so much in the unspeakable mysteriousness of, it, of the phenomenon. After all, freedom may be mysterious but the mystery is encountered every day, as in the strictly limited scope of scientific methods. An empirical science must operate with certain assumptions, one of which is that of the of universal causality every object of scientific scrutiny, scrutiny is presumed to have an anterior cause an object of an even that is its ground cause lies outside the scientific universe of this cause yet freedom has precisely the, that character for this reason no amount of scientific research will ever uncover a phenomenon that can be designed as free. Whatever may appear as free within the subjective consciousness of an individual will find its place in the scientific seem as a link in some, say, some chain of caution. Freedom and causality are not logically contradictory terms. However, there are terms that belong to disparate frames of reference. It is, therefore, Idle to expect that scientific methods will be able to uncover freedom by some procedure of elimination, peeling up costs on causes, until one arrives at residual phenomenon that does not seem to have a cause and can be proclaimed as being free. Freedom is not that which is uncaused. Similarly, one cannot arrive at freedom by looking at instances where scientific prediction fall down. Freedom is not unpredictable. Freedom is not unpredictability. As Weber has shown, it is well the case that madmen would be the freest the freest human being. The individual who is conscious of his own freedom does not stand outside the world of causality, but rather perceives his own volition as a very special category, category of cause different from the other causes that he must reckon with. The difference, how the difference, however, is not subject to scientific demonstration. An analogy may be helpful here. Just as freedom and causality are not contradictory, but rather disparate terms, so are utility and beauty. The two, no, the two do not logically exclude each other, but one cannot, but one cannot establish the reality of the one by demonstrating the, the reality the, 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 of the other. It is possible to take a specific object, say a piece of furniture, and so consecutively that it that it had that it has a certain utility for human living to sit on, eat on, sleep in, or what have you. However, no matter what utility one can prove, one will get no closer to the question of whether the chair, table of table of bed is beautiful. In other words, the utilitarian and the aesthetic reflexes of this of this course are strictly inconsumable. In terms of social scientific method, what it faced with a way of thinking that assumes a priori that the human world is a casually closed system. The method would not be scientific if it thought otherwise. Freedom as a special kind of course 
ex is excluded from this system a priori in terms of social phenomena. The social scientists must assume an infinite reg regress of, of causes, none of them holding a privileged ontological status. If we cannot explain a phenomenon causally by one set of sociological categories, he will try another one. If, all, if political causes do not seem satisfactory, he will try economic ones. And if the entire conceptual apparatus of sociology seems inadequate to explain a given phenomenon, he may switch to a different apparatus such as the psychological or the biological one. But in doing so, he will still move within the scientific cosmos. That is, he will discover new orders of causes, but he will not encounter freedom. There is no way of perceiving freedom, either in oneself or in another human being, except through a subject subjective inner certainty that dissolves as soon as it, it is attacked, attack, attacked with the tools of scientific analysis. Nothing is farther from the intentions of this writer than to come out now with a statement of allegiance to that positivistic creed still fashionable among the some American social scientists that believes in, in only those fragments of reality that can be dealt with scientifically. Such positivism results most invariably in one form of another intellectual barbarism as has been demonstrated admirably in, in the recent history of behavioristic psychology in this country. Nevertheless, must one, one must keep a kosher kitchen if, if one's intellectual nourishment is not to become hopelessly polluted. That is, one must not pour the milk of subjective insight over the meat of scientific interpretation. Such regression does not mean that, that one cannot release what forms in sustenance, only that one cannot do so in a single dish. It follows that, it follows that if our arguments if our, if our argument wanted to remain rigid within the sociological frame of reference, which is a scientific one, we could not speak about freedom at all. We would not then we would then have to leave the reader to his own devices in getting out of his claustro claustrophobic corner. Si since these lines, fortunately, do not appear in a sociological journal and are not to be recited at the ceremonial gathering of the for profession. There is no need to be as ascetic as, 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 as all that. Instead, we shall follow the courses. First, still remaining within, within the mode of human existence provided by sociological perspective itself, we shall try to show that the contrast both external and internal, may not be as infallible as they were made to appear so far. Secondly, we, subs we shall step outside the narrowly scientific frame of reference and postulate the reality of freedom, after which we shall, shall, try, to, shall try to see what the sociological model looks like from the vantage point of this postu postulation. In the first course, we shall give some further touches to our sociological perspective. In the second, we shall seek to obtain some human perspective on sociological perspective. Let us return to the point of, in our argument at the end of the last chapter in which we maintained that our own cooperation is needed to bring us into social captivity, which is the nature of this cooperation. One possibility of answering this question is to take up once more Thomas' concept of the definition of the situation. We can then argue that whatever the external internal pressures of society may be, in most cases we ourselves must be at least con called definers of the social the social situation in question. That is, whatever the prehistory of this may be, we ourselves are called to an act of collaboration in the maintenance of the particular de definition. However, another possibility of getting at the above question is to switch to another system of sociological conceptualization, namely that of Weber. We contend that a Weberian approach at this point will serve as a, will serve as a helpful balance 
to the document angle on social existence. Talcott Parsons has compared Weberian sociology to other approaches by calling it voluntaristic, although Weber's conception of scientific methodology was far too Kantian to allow for the introduction of the idea of freedom into his system. Parsons' term is up in, st in distinguishing the Weberian emphasis on the intentionality of social actions as against the Durkheimian lack of interest in this dimension. As we have seen, Durkheim stressed the externality, objectivity, thing like character of social reality, one is almost tempted here, tempted here to use the scholastic term quiddity. Against this, Weber always emphasizes the subjective meanings, intentions, are int intentions and interpretations go into any social situation by the actors participating in it. Weber, of course, also points out that what eventually happens in society may be very different from what, they, what, from what these actors meant or intended. But he asserts that this entire subjective dimension must be taken into consideration for an adequate sociological understanding. Verstehen is the technical term used to denote the latter a term that has been taken over into the into English sociological parlance. That is, sociological understanding involves the interpretation of meanings present in society. In this view, each social, each social situation is sustained by the fabric of meanings that are brought into it by the several participants. It is clear, of course, that in a situation whose meaning is strongly established by tradition and common consent, a single individual cannot accomplish very much by proffering a deviant definition. At the, at the very least, however, he can bring about his alienation from the situation. The possibility of marginal existence in society is already an indication that the commonly agreed upon, agreed upon meanings are not omnipotent in their capacity to coerce. But more interesting are those cases where individuals succeed in capturing enough of a following to make their deviant interpretations of the world stick. At least within the cycle of this following, this possibility of breaking through the world taken for granted. A society is developed in Weber's theory of charisma. The term derived from the New Testament where, however, it is used in a very different sense, the not social authority that is not be, that is not based on tradition or legality, but rather on the extraordinary impact of, of an individual leader. The religious prophet who defies the established order of things in the name of an absolute authority given to him by divine command is the prototype of the charismatic leader. One can think one can think here of historical figures such as the Buddha, Jesus, or Muhammad. Charisma, however, can also appear in the profound areas of life, especially the political one. One can here think of such personages as Caesar or Napoleon. The paradigmatic form, the paradigmatic form, form of such charismatic authority setting itself up against the established order can be found in Jesus' retreat a section that you are you have heard it said, but I say to you, it it is but like it is but lies a uh, claim rightfully to sus su supersede whatever what uh, what regarded it as pending before. Typically, then charisma constitutes a tremendously passionate challenge to to the power of predefinition. Pre it substitutes the new meanings for all and radically redefines the assumptions of human existence. Charisma is not to, is not to be understood as some sort of miracle that, uh, that occurs without reference that what has happened be, because, before or to social context it's of its appearance. Nothing in, his, nothing in history is free of ties with the past. Also, as Weber's theory of charisma has developed in great detail, the extraordinary passion of a charismatic movement only rarely survives for longer than one generation. 
Infallible charisma becomes what Weber called routinist, routinized, that is, before it reintegrated into the structures of society in much less radical forms. Prophets are followed by popes, revolutionaries by administrators. When the great Catholic cataclysm of religious or political revolution is over and men have settled down to, lie, to live under what was considered a new order, it invariably turns out that the changes have not been quite as, as total as it as did first appeared. Economic interests and political ambitions take over at the point where ins insurrectionary focus has, has begun to cool. The old habits reassert themselves then, and the order created by the charismatic revolution begins to acquire disturbing similarities with the ancient regime that is overthrew with some with so much violence. Depending on one's values, this fact may sadden, may sadden or comfort one. What interests us, however, is not the long-range weakness of rebellion in history, but its possibility in the first place. It is, it is not worthy in this connection that Weber regarded charisma as one of the principal moving forces in history, despite his clear insight into the fact that charisma is always a very short life phenomenon. But however, the old patterns may, uh, may reappear in the course of the routinization of charisma, the world is never quite the same again, the same again. Even though, e even though the change has been much less than the revolutionaries hoped or expected change, there has been none the less. Sometimes only the passage of much time of my time shows just how deep the changes the change has gone. This is why almost all attempts at total counter revolution fail in history, as such undertakings as as the Council of Threat of the or the Congress of Vienna illustrates. The lesson to be derived from this for our sociological perspective is simple, almost platitu, platitudinous, but none the, but nonetheless significant for a more balanced picture. It is possible to challenge effectively the Leviathan of predefinition. Or to put the same thing negatively, in terms of our previous discussion, it is possible to withhold our cooperation with history. Part of the inexorable impression conveyed by Duhemian and related views of society comes from their not paying sufficient attention to the historical process itself. No structure, structure, no social structure, however massive it may appear in the present, existed in the massivity from the dawn of time. Somewhere along the line, each one of its salient features was con coated, concocted by human beings, whether they were charismatic visionaries, clever cooks, Conquering heroes or just individuals in positions of power who hit on what seemed to, de to them a better way of running the show. Since all social systems were created by men, it follows that men can also change them. Indeed, one of the limitations of the aforementioned view of society, which to emphasize this again, give us a valid perspective on social reality, <coughs> is that it is difficult to account for the change within the frame of the reference. This is where the historical orientation of the Weberian approach the re redressed the balance. The Durkheimian and Weberian ways of looking at society are not logical contradictory. They are only anti <coughs> antithetical since they focus on different aspects of social reality. It, it is quite correct to say that society is for evocative fact coercing and even creating us. But it is also correct to say that our unmeaningful acts help to support the edifice of society and may on occasion help to change it. Indeed, the two indeed the two statements contain between them the paradox of social existence. The society defines us but is in turn but is in turn defined by us. This paradox is what we have alluded to become in terms of so our, our coalition and collaboration with society. As soon as we view society in this way, however, it appears 
very much more fragile than it than it did from the world from the other vantage point. We need the recognition of social to be human, to have an image of ourselves, to have an identity. But society needs the recognition of many like us in order to exist at all. In other words, it is not only ourselves but society that exists by virtue of definition. It will depend on our social location in our social location as to whether our refusal to recognize a particular social reality will have much an effect. It does not help it does it does not have the slave much to refuse to recognize his his enslavement. It's a different story when one of the masters does so. However, systems of slavery have always reacted violently, violently to such a challenge even, their, even from their humblest victims. It would seem then that just as there is no total power in society, there is also no total importance. The master in society recognize this fact and apply the controls accordingly. It follows that the control systems are in constant need of confirmation and reconfirmation by those they are meant to control. It is possible to withhold such confirmation in a number of ways. Each one constitutes a treat of to, a treat to society as defined officially. The possibilities to take into consideration here are those of transformation, detachment, and manipulation. Our reference to charisma has already indicated in what way the transformation of social definitions may occur. Charisma, of course, is not the only factor that can induce change in society. Any process of social change, however, is connected with new definitions of reality. Any such redefinitions means that, or that someone begins to act contrary to expectations directed toward him in line with the old definition. The master expects a bow from his slave and instead gets a fist in his face. It will depend, of course, on how frequent such incidents are whether we speak of individual defiance or social disorganizations of social or social disorganization to use common social terms when an individual refuses to recognize the social definition of economic rights we will be faced with a phenomenon of crime namely those acts of defiance that are listed in it in the EPR statistics as crimes against poverty but when masses of, of individuals under political leadership engage in the same refusal we confront a revolution be it in the form of, esta of the establishment of a social order or more mildly in a radical new tax system the social differences between individual defiance such as crime and the wholesale dis and reorganization of an entire of an entire social system such as revolution are obvious both however are significant in terms of our argument in showing that positive possibility of resistance to the external and of necessity also the internal controls in fact we, we when we look at revolutions we find that the outward acts again the against the old order are invariably preceded by the by the disintegration of inward allegiance and loyalties the image of of kings double before their plans to as albert salomon has shown the distortion of the poor people's conception of their rules can be illustrated by the affair of the queen of the queen's necklace before the french revolution and, Ra and the rasputin case before the russian the, in the ongoing insurrection of certain negus against the segregation system in our own time was similar was similarly preceded by a long process in which the long the old definitions of their role were discredited in the nation at last and destroyed the, in their own nuns a process by the way in which social science scientists including what certain ones played a not play a not significant insignificant parts insignificant part in other words 
long before so such systems are brought down in, da in violence. They are deprived of their ideological sustenance by contempt. No recognition and counter definition of social norms are always potentially revolutionary. However, we can look at we can look at much more routine cases in which particular social situations can be transformed or at least sabotaged by a refusal to accept their previous definitions. If we may make a rather unscholarly reference here, we would point to the opus of English humorist Stephen Potter as an excellent guide to the subtle art of social sabotage. What Porter calls the ploy, the ploy is precisely the technique of redefining a social institution contrary to general expectations, and doing so in such a way that the other participants in the situation are caught off guard and find themselves helpless to counterattack. The patient who rearranges pawn calls in such a way that he converts his, doc his doctor's consultation room into a business office. The American tourists in England, in England who lectures in his English house on the antiquities of London, the, un the, the non-church-going house guest who manages truly to upset his church-going house on Sunday morning by alluding to his own darkly es es esoteric religious preference that would not possibly permit him to join them all. These are instances of what could be called successful micro-sociological micro -socio sabotage. Picayun compared to the Promotian Boulevardsmen of the Great Revolutionary, but nonetheless revealing of the innate pre precariousness of the social fabric. And if his moral prejudices allow, the reader can readily test the validity of the portrait technique of social of social demolition, which might well be called with due apologies to Madison Avenue, the engineer of the sun. Let him pretend to be a tolerant but firm abstainer at a New York cocktail party or an initiate of some mystical, mystical at a Methodist church picnic or a psychoanalysis at a businessman luncheon in each case. He is quite likely to find that the introduction of a dramatic character that does not fit into, scan into the scenario of the particular play seriously threatens the role playing of those who do fit. Experiences such as this may lead to a sudden refusal in one's view of society, from an awe inspiring vision of an edifice made of massive granite to the picture of a toy house precariously put together with papier mache. While such metamorphosis may be disturbing to people who have either too had great confidence in the stability and rightness of society, it can also have a very liberating effect on those more inclined to upon uh, to upon the latter as a giant side sitting on the sitting on top of them, and not necessarily a friendly giant at that. It is reassuring to discover that the giant is afflicted with a nervous stick. If one cannot transform or sabotage society, one can withdraw from it inwardly. Detachment has been a method of resistance to social controls at least since Lao Tzu and was made into a theory of resistance of by the Stoic. The person who retires from the social stage into religious, intellectual or artistic domains of his own making still, of course, carries into this into this this self imposed exile language, identity, identity and store and store of knowledge that he initially achieved at the hands of society. Nevertheless, it is possible to frequently at considerable psychological cost to build for oneself a castle of the mind in which the day-by-day -day expectations of society can be almost completely ignored. And as one does this, the intellectual character of this castle is more and more shaped by oneself rather than by the ideologies of the surrounding social system. If one finds others to join one in such an enterprise, one can in very real sense create a counter society whose relations with the other the legitimate social can be reduced to diplomatic minimum. 
is identically in that case the psychological burden of such detachment can be greatly minimized. Such context society is constructed on the base of deviant and detached definitions exist in the form of sex, cults, inner, inner cycles, or other groups that sociologists can subculture. If we want to emphasize the normative and cognitive separateness of such groups, the term such world way, the term such world may be an after one. A such world exists as an island of deviant meanings within the sea of its society to adapt the phrase that Karl Mayer used eloquently to describe the social character of religious sectarianism. The, the individual who enters such a sub world from the new from the outside is made to feel very strongly that he is entire that is entering an entirely different universe at in, of discourse. Eccentricity, religiosity, subversive politics, unconventional sexuality, illegal pleasures, any of these are capable of creating a sub world carefully shielded from the from the elect for, from the elect of both physical and legal controls of the larger larger society thus a modern a modern american city may contain well hidden from public view its subter subterranean words of theosophists trotskists homosexuals or drug addicts speaking their own own language in its terms building a universe infinitely far removed in meaning from the world of their fellow citizens indeed the anonymity and freedom of movement of modern urban life greatly facilitate the building of such underworlds. However, it is important to emphasize that that least rebellious constructions of the mind can also liberate the individual to a considerable extent from the definitory system of his society. Men who passionately devote of his life to the source to the study of pure mathematics, theoretical physics, Agriology or Zoroastrianism can afford to pay a minimum of attention to routine social demands as long as he can so he can somehow manage to survive economically in the pursuit of his interest. And what is more important, the direction of thinking that this universes of discourse will naturally lead him to will have a very high degree of autonomy indeed vis a vis the routine the routine to, to a pattern that constitute the worldview of the man's society. What may recall here the thoughts delivered at the category of mathematics to pure mathematics and may it never be of any use to anybody. Unlike some of the example, unlike some of the example mentioned, early, mentioned earlier, the kind of subword does not arise out of rebellion against society as such but it leads all the same to an autonomous intellectual universe within which an individual can exist with almost only big detachment. Put differently, it is possible for men alone, alone or in, in groups to construct their own, world, their, own, or their own worlds and on this basis to detach themselves from the world into which they, origin, they were originally socialized. The discussion of the art of ploying has already brought us close to the third majority, to the third major way of escaping the tyranny of society, that of manipulation. Here, the individual does not try to transform the social structures, nor does he detach himself from them. Rather, he makes deliberate as deliberate use of them in ways unforeseen by their legitimate guardians cutting a path through the social jungle in accordance with his own purposes. Irving Goffman, in his analysis of the world of inmates, be it of mental hospitals or prisons or other coercive institutions, has given us vivid examples of how it is possible to work the system, that is, to utilize, in, to utilize it in ways not provided for in the official operative procedures, the config who works in the prison laundry and uses its machinery, its machinery to wash his own socks. The patient, the patient who gets good access to the staff communication system 
to transmit per to transmit personal messages. The soldier who managed to transport his girlfriends in military vehicles. All these are working the system, thereby proclaiming their own relative independence of its tyrannical demands. It would be rash to dismiss such manipulations too quickly as pathetic and, ine and ineffective efforts at, at rebellion. There have been instructive cases in which multiple surgeons successfully ran call girl rings and hospital patients uses the official messages message center as a bulky bulky joint such operations going on in subterranean sub fashion for long periods of time an industrial soci sociology is full of examples of how workers can employ the official organization of a factory for post purposes deviant from and sometimes contradictory to the intentions of management. The ingenuity human beings are capable of in circumferencing and subverting even the most elaborate control system is a refreshing antidote to sociologistic depression. It is, a, it is as relief from social determinism that we could explain the sympathy that we frequently feel for the swindler, the imposter or, or the carlatan. As long at any rate, at it, as it is not some ourselves who are being swindled. The, this figure symbolizes a social machiavellianism that understands society true and if and then, truly and then, untrammeled by illusions, find a, finds a way of manipulating of society for its own ends. In literature, there are there are characters such as Andre Gidditz, Andre Gidditz, Lafcadio, or Thomas Mann's Felix Kuhl that illustrate this, fascina this fascination. In real life, we could point to a man like Ferdinand Waldo de Mara Jr., who, bambus who bambuzzled a, a long line of eminent specialists in various fields into accepting, his, into accepting him as a college successfully impersonating such respected social identities as college professor, military officer, penologist, and even surgeon. Inevitably, in watching the swindle take on various laws of respectable society, we are pushed towards the uncomfortable impression that those who, lots, who hold these calls legitimately may, may have attained the status by procedures not so drastically different from the ones employed by him, and if now, if and if one knows the bamboo, bamboo sling, bunkum, and to use Potter's term, up one up means then that going to say a professorial carry one may even come dangerously close to the con conclusion that society is a swindle to begin with, in one way or another. We are all impostors. The ignoramus impersonates erudition, the court honesty, the skeptic conviction, and any normal university could not exist without the first confidence trick, no business organization without the second, and no church without the third. Another, another, uh, another concept elaborated by Goffman is helpful in this connection. The one he calls role distance. By this, Goffman means the playing of a role tongue-in-cheek without really meaning it and, wi and with an ulterior purpose. Every strongly coercive situation will produce this phenomenon. The native underlying place plays up to the Pukka Sahib in the expected way while planning the day on which all white throats will be cut. The Negro domestic plays the Negro domestic plays the role of self depressing depreciating clown and the enlisted men that speak and spend military fanatic but with hind thought that are diametrically contrary to the mythology within their roles have a meaning they in what reject. As government points out this kind of duplicity is the only way by way by, by is the only way by which human dignity can be maintained within the self-awareness of people in such situations.
but Goffman's concept could be applied more widely to all cases where a god is played deliberately without indirect identification. In other words, when the actor has established an inner distance between his consciousness and his role playing, such cases are of paramount importance for sociological perspective because they depart from the normal pattern. This, as we have been at pains to point out, is that roles are played a play, a play with total reflection in immediate and almost authentic auto, in a, an almost aut, a, automatic response to the expectations of the situation. Here, this spark of unconsciousness is suddenly dispelled. In many instances, this may not affect the visible cause, cause of events, yet it constitutes a quality, qualitatively di different from different form of existence in society. Goal distance marks the point at which the marionette clown become by, becomes by, by the, by the, the puppet theater is transformed into a living stage. Of course, there is a still script, a stage management and repertoire that includes one's role, one's own role, one's own role. but one is now playing the play the part playing the part in question with full consciousness as soon as this happiness there is the ominous possibility that Bajaccio may jump out of his role and stop playing the tragic hero or, or that Hamlet may begin to do some salt and sing dirty, dirty duties. Let us repeat our previous assertion that all revolution begin in transformation of consciousness. A useful concept to introduce in this connection is that of ecstasy. By this, we refer not to some abnormal heightening of consciousness in a mystic sense, but rather, quite literally, to act of standing or stepping outside, literally ecstasies, or to take the taken for granted routines of society. In our discussion of alternation, we have already touched upon a very important form of ecstasy in our sense, namely the one that takes place when an individual is enabled to jump from world to world in his social existence. However, even without such an exchange of universes, it is possible to achieve distance and detachment vis a vis once one world. As soon as a given role is played without an inner commitment deliberately and deceptively, the actor is in an ecstatic state with regard to this, to his world taken for granted. What what, what are the regret as fit? He looks upon as a set of factors triggered with in his operations. What other assumed to be essential identity he handles as an convincing disguise. In other words, ecstasy transforms one's awareness of society in such a way that giftness be becomes possibility. While this begins as a state of consciousness, it should be evident that sooner or later there are bound to be significant consequences in terms of action. From the point of view of the official guardians of others, of other, it is dangerous to have too many individuals around playing the social game with inner reservations. The consideration of role distance and ecstasy as possible elements of social existence raises an interesting social sociology of knowledge question, namely whether there are social contexts of groups that particularly facilitate such consciousness. Kalman, Kalman Heim, who greatly favored such a development on ethical and political grounds, a position that some might man, that some might want to debate, spent a good deal of time looking for its possible social ground. His view of the freely suspended intelligentsia, that is, a stratum of intellectuals with minimal involvement in the vested interests of society as the best carriers, as the best carriers of the of this sort of the of liberated consciousness may be disputed. At the same time, there can be little doubt that certain kinds of intellectual training and activity are capable of leading to ecstasy, as we indicated in our discussion of the forms of detachment. Other tentative generalizations can be made. 
ecstasy is more likely to take place in urban than in rural cultures, while the classical role of the cities as places of political freedom and liberality in thought among groups that are marginal to society than among those at the center, fight the historic relationship of European Jews to various liberating intellectual movements, or, in a very different way, take the example of the itinerant Bulgarian journeyman carrying into carrying the Machinian heresy all the way across Europe into Provence, as it is also more likely in groups that are insecure in their social position than among those that are secure by the, con the production of the banking ideologies among rising classes that have, a fight, that have to fight against an unestablished order, the rising French bourgeois in the 17th and 18th centuries providing us with a prime example. Such individual location of the phenomenon reminds us once more that, what, that not even total rebellion, take, rebellion takes place in a social vacuum without predefinitions. Even nihilism is predefined in terms of the structures it is driven to negate, to negate before one can have atheism. For instance, there must be an idea of God. In other words, even liberation for social goals takes place within limits that are social themselves. Nevertheless, our consideration of the various forms of ecstasy has taken us some way from a deterministic corner into which our to which our previous argument had chased us. We, try, we thus arrived at the third, at the third picture of society after those, uh, after those of prison and the paper and the puppet theater, namely that of society as a state populated with living actors. This third picture does not ob does not ob obliterate the previous two, but it is more adequate in terms of the additional social phenomena we have considered. That is the dramatic, so the dramatic model of society at which we have arrived now. We arrive now does not deny that the actors on the stage are constrained by all the external control set up by the impresario and internal ones of the whole inter of the role itself. All the same, the, they have opinions of playing their, their parts enthusiastically, of sullenly, or sullenly of, of playing with inner conviction or with distance and sometimes of refusing to all to play at all. Looking at society through the medium of this dramatic model greatly changes our our general sociological perspective. Social reality now seems to be precariously projected based on the cooperation of many individual actors, or perhaps a better simil would be taken will be that of acrobats engaged in perilous balancing acts, holding up between them the swaying structure of the social world, stage theater, theater circus, and even carnival. Here we have the imagery of our dramatic model with a conception of society as, as precarious, uncertain, often unpredictable. The institution the institutions of society, while they do in fact constrain and coerce us, appear at the same time as dramatic conventions, even fictions. They have been invented by past impresarios, and future ones may cast them back into the nothingness once they emerge. Acting out the social drama, we keep pretending that these precarious conventions are eternal verities. We act as if there were not, there were no other way of being a man, a political subject, a religious devotee, or one who exercises a certain profession, yet at times, a thought, yet at times the thought presses to the minds of even the demise among us that we could do a, that we could do very, very different things. If social reality is drama dramatically created, it must also be dramatically malleable. In this way, the dramatic, models, the dramatic model opens up a passage out of the rigid determinism into which social, sociological thought originally led us.
Before we leave behind us our narrow sociological argument, we would like to point to a classical contribution that is very relevant to the points just made, the theory of sociability of German sociologist Georg Simmel, a contemporary of Weber's whose approach to sociology, sociology, to sociology differed considerably from the letters. Simmel argued that sociability and the usual meaning of this word in the play form of social interaction are the party people play society that is then in many forms of social interaction but without the usual sting of seriousness sociability changes serious communication to non-committal conversation eros to co coquetry ethics to manners aesthetics to taste a simple source the world of sociability is a precarious and artificial creation that can be started at any moment by someone who refuses to play the game. The man who engages in passionate debate at the party spoils the game, as does the one who carries flirtation to the point of open seduction of party is not an orgy, or the one who openly promotes business interest under the guise of harmless chit-chat. Party conversation must at least pretend to be disinterested. Those who participate in the situation of pure sociability temporarily leave behind their serious identities and move into a transitory world of make-believe, which consists, among other things, of the playful pretense that those concerned have been freed, have been freed from the works of position, property, and patience normally attached to them. Anyone who brings the in the gravity, in both sense of the word, of serious outside interest immediately surtax of this fragile this the fragile artifice artifice of make believe. This incidentally is why pure sociability is rarely possible except among social equals. Since otherwise the pretense is too strenuous to maintain a safety office party source and painfully. We are not particularly interested in the phenomenon of sociability for its own sake, but we can now relate what Simmel maintains about it to our earlier consideration of Mead's notion that, so that social roles are learned to play. We contend that, so we contend that sociability could not exist at all as the artifice as the artifice it is if society at last did not have a similarly artificial character in other words sociability is a special case of playing society more consciously fixed fictitious less tied up with the urgent ambitious ambitions of the one of one's career but yet of one piece with a much larger social fabric that one can also play with it is precisely through such play, as we have seen, that the start learns to take on his serious roles. In sociability, we return for some moments to the masquerading of childhood, hence perhaps the pleasure of it. But it is assuming too much to think that the marks of the serious world are terribly different from those of this world of play. One place the master polemic contour at the party and the men of term will at the will at the office. Party tax party tax has a way of being translated into political finesse, shrewdness in business, into the adroit handling of etiquette for, for purposes of sociability. Or if you like, there is a nexus between social graces and social skills in general. In this fact, lies the sociological certification of the social training of diplomats as well as debutantes, debutants. By playing society, one learns one learns how to be a social actor anywhere, and this is possibly and this is possible only because society has as a whole has the character of play of a play, as the Dutch historian Johan Huizinga has brilliantly shown in his book Homo Ludens, it seems possible to grasp human culture at all unless we look at we look at its subspecies Ludi.
under the aspect of play and playfulness. With these thoughts, we have come to the very limits of what it is still possible to say within a socio-scientific frame of reference. Within the latter, we cannot go any farther in lifting from the reader the deterministic burden of our earlier argumentation, compared with this argumentation. What has been stated in the present chapter so many far, so in, in the present chapter so far, may appear rather weak and less than conclusive. This is un, this is unavoidable. To repeat ourselves, it is impo it is impossible a priori to come upon freedom in its in its full sense by scientific means or within a scientific universe of discourse. The closest, the closest we have been able to come is to show, in certain situations, a certain freedom from social controls. We cannot possibly discover freedom to act socially by scientific means, even if we should find holes in the order of causality that can be established sociologically, the psychologist, the biologist, or some other dealer in concessions will step and in we step in and stuff up our whole with material span for him for his cloth of determinism. But since we have made no promises in this book to limit ourselves as, as critically to scientific logic, we are now ready to approach social existence from a very different direction. We have not been we have not been able to get at freedom sociologically and we release that we never can so be it let us see let's let us see now how we can look at so how we can look at our sociological model itself from a different vantage point as we remarked before only an intellectual barbarian is likely to maintain that reality is only that which can be grasped by scientific methods. Since, hopefully, we have tried to stay out of this category, our socializing has been carried on in the foreground of another view of human existence that is not itself sociological or even scientific. Nor is this view particularly eccentric, but rather the common or if very different elaborated anthropology of those who credit men with the capacity for freedom. Obviously, a philosophical discussion of such an anthropology would utterly break the framework of this book and would, for that matter, lie beyond the competence of its writer. But while no attempt will be made here to provide a philosophical introduction to the question of human freedom, it is necessary to our argument that at least some indications be given of how it is possible to think sociologically without abandoning this notion of freedom and more of that and more than that in what way a few of men that is include the idea of freedom may take cognizance of social dimension we contend that here is an, an important area of dialogue between philosophy and the social sciences that will that still contains the first tracks of virgin territory we point to the work of Alfred Schwartz and to the contemporary efforts of Maurice Nathanson as indicating the direction in which the dialogue, this dialogue could move. Our own remarks in the following page still, page will, pages will, of necessity, be exceedingly sketchy, but it is hoped that they will suffice to indicate to the reader that sociological thought need not necessarily end in a positivity swamp. We shall now begin with the postulate that men are free and from this new starting point return to the same problem of social assistance. In doing this, we shall find the helpful some concept developed by existentialist philosophers, though we shall use this though we, we shall use this without any doctrinaire intentions. Here, here with the reader is invited to undertake an epistemological salto mortal and this behind him to return to the matter at hand. Let us retrace our steps to the point where we look at Galen's theory of institutions. 
The latter we will call are interpreted in this theory as channeling human conduct very much along the lines the instincts channel the behavior of men, of animals. When we considered this theory, we made the remark that the we, we, we made the remark that there is, however, one crucial difference between the two kinds of channeling. The animal, if it reflected on the matter of following its instincts, would say, I have no choice. Men, explaining why they obey their institutional imperatives, say the same. The difference is, the difference is that the animal would be saying the truth, the men deceiving themselves. Why? Because, in fact, they can say, they can say no to society and often say and often have done so. There may be unpleasant consequences if they take this course. They may not even think about it as a possibility because they take their own obedience for granted. This, the, their institutional character may be the maybe the only identity they can imagine having with the alternative seeming to them as a jump into madness. This does not change the fact that it's the statement I must is a deceptive one in almost a social, in almost every social situation. For our new vantage point within an anthropological frame of reference that recognizes uh, men as free, we can usefully apply to this problem that Jean Paul Sartre has called bad faith. To put it very simply, bad faith is to pretend something is necessary that in fact is voluntary. But faith is thus a flag for freedom, a dishonest evasion of the agony of choice. But faith expresses itself in innumerable, innumerable human situations from the most commonplace to the most catastrophic. The waiter shuffling though his appointed runs in a cafe is in bad faith insofar as he pretends to himself that the waiter Role reconstitutes his real existence that if only for the hour for the hours he is high, he is the waiter. The woman who lets her body be seduced step by step while continuing to carry on innocent conversation is in bad faith in so far as she pretends that she pretends that what is happening to her body is not under is not under his control. The terrorist who kills and excuses himself by saying that he had no choice because the party ordered him to kill is in bad faith because he pretends that his existence is necessarily linked with the party, while in fact this linkage is the consequence of his own choice. It can easily be it can easily be, be seen that bad faith covers society like a film of lies. The very possibility of bad faith, however, serves as the reality of freedom. Men can be in bad faith only because he is free and does not wish to face his freedom. Bad faith is the shadow of human liberty, is a time to escape that liberty is doomed to, to defeat. For, as Sartre has famous of put it, we are condemned to freedom. If we apply this concept to our sociological perspective, we will suddenly be faced with a starting conclusion, the complex of world within which we exist in society now appears to us in an to us as an immense apparatus of bad faith. Its role carries with it the possibility of bad faith. Every man who says I have no choice in referring to what his social goals demands of his is engaged in bad faith. Now we can easily imagine circumstances in which this confession will be true to the extent that there is no choice within that particular role. Nevertheless, the individual has the choice of stepping outside the role. It is true that, given certain circumstances, a businessman has no choice but brutally to destroy a competitor unless he is go. He is to go bankrupt his bankrupt himself. But it is he who chooses brutality over bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. It is true that a man has no choice but to betray a homosexual attachment if he is to retain his position in respectable society, but he is the one making the choice between respectability and loyalty to that attachment. It is true that in some cases a judge has no choice but to sentence a man to death 
but in doing so he chooses to be made a judge an occupation chosen by him in the knowledge that it might lead to this and he chooses not to resent instead when faced with the prospect of this death. Men are responsible for their actions. They are in bad faith when they attribute to iron necessity the, what they themselves are choosing to do. Even the law itself, the master fortress of bad faith, has begun to, has bega, has begun to take cognizance of this fact and its dealings with Nazi, with Nazi, with Nazi war criminals. Sartre has given us a masterful vista of the operation of bad faith as its most malevolent in his portrayal of the antisemite as a human type. The antisemite is the man who frantically identifies himself with mythological entities, nation, race, folk, and in doing so seeks to defend himself of the knowledge of his own freedom. Antisemitism, or we might add any other form of racist or fanatical nationalism, is bad faith par excellence because it identifies men in their human totality with their social character. Humanity itself becomes a facticity devoid of freedom. One then loves, hates, and kills within a mythological world in which all men are the social destinations as the SS man is what his insignia says, and, it, and the Jew is the symbol of despicability seen <coughs> on his conception concentration camp uniform. Bad faith in this form is ultimate malignancy, however, is not limited to the Kafka world of Nazism and its totalitarian analogies. It exists in our own society in identical, identical patterns of self deception. It is only as one long series of acts of bad faith that capital punishment continues to exist in allege, allegedly human societies. Our doctors, just like the Nazi ones, present themselves as conscientious public servants with an impeccable of mediocre private morality who reluctantly overcome their weakness in order to do duty. We will not do we will not at this point go to into the ethical implication of such bad faith. We shall do so briefly in this in the discussion that follows this chapter. We would rather return here to starting few of society that we have reached as a result of these considerations. Since society exists as a network network of social roles, each one of which can become a chronic or a momentary uh, alibi for taking responsibility for its bureau. We can say that deception and self racism are are at the very heart of social reality, nor is this an accidental quality that could somehow be eradicated by some moral reformation of other. The deception inherent in social structures is a functional imperative. Society can maintain itself only if its fictions, its as if character to use hands for fingers time, time, are accorded to ontolo according to ontological status by at least some of its members some of the time, or, or let us say, let us say, society as we have so far known, in, known it in human history. Society provides for the individual a gigantic mechanism by which he can hide from himself his own freedom. Yet this character of society as an immense conspiracy in bad faith is just as in the case of the individual, but an expression of the possibility of freedom that exists by feet of society. We are social beings and our existence is bound to specific social locations. The same social situations that can be that can become traps of bad faith can also be occasions for freedom. Every social goal can be played knowingly or blindly. And in so far as it is played knowingly, it becomes a vehicle of our own decisions. If social institution can be an alibi instrument of alienation or from our freedom, but at least some institutions can become protective for the actions of women. Of women. In this way, an understanding of bad faith does not necessarily lead, lead us to a view of society as the universal realm of reason, but rather illuminates more clearly the paradoxical and infinitely precarious character of social existence.
another concept of existentialist philosophy useful for Agagumenu is what Martin Heidegger has called the man. The Greek word is un un the Greek word is untraceable literally into English. It is used in German in the same way that one is used in English in such a sentence as one does not do that, man to does night does nich. The French word on conveys the same meaning. Then Joseph Ortega Yegaset has got Heidegger intention in well in Spanish with his concept of lo que se hace. In other words, man refers to to a deliberately fucked generality of human beings. It is not this man who will who will not do this, nor that man, nor nor you nor I, nor you nor I. It is in some way all men, but so generally that it may just as well be nobody. It is in this far sense that a child is taught one does to pick one's nose in public. The concrete child, with his concretely in irritating nose, is subsumed under an anonymous generality that has no face and yet bears down powerfully on the child's conduct. In fact, and this ought to give us a long pause, Heidegger's man, Heidegger man bears uncanny resemblance to what Mead had, has called the generalist other. In Heidegger's system of thought, the concept of the man is, real, is related to his discussion of authenticity and inauthenticity. To exist, to exist authentic, authentically is to live in full awareness of the unique, irreplaceable and comparable quantity of one's individuality. By contrast, inauthentic existence is to lose oneself in the anonymity of the man, surrendering one's uniqueness to, to the socially constituted abstractions. This is especially important in the way one's one faces it. The truth of matter is that it is always one single, solitary individual who dies, but society confers the perfect and those who are, that, who are to die themselves by subsuming its death under general categories that appear to assume to assist its horror. A man dies and will say, well, we all have to go someday. This, as this we all in an exact tradition the, of the man, it's everybody and does nobody, and by putting ourselves under its generality, we hide from ourselves and in, in, in the inevitable the fact that we too shall die, sink and solitary. Heidegger himself has referred to the to Tolstoy's story, the death of Ivan Ilyich, as the best literary expression of inauthenticity in the facing of death. As an illustration of authenticity to the point of torment, we would submit Federico, Federico Garcia Lorca's unforgettable poem about the death of a bullfighter, Lemon from Ignacio Sanchez Medias. Heidegger's concept of man is relevant for our view of society, not so much in its normative as in its cognitive aspects. Under the aspect of bad fit, we have seen society as a mechanism to provide alibis for freedom. Under the aspect of the man, we see society as a defense defense against terror. Society provides us with taken for granted structures. We could speak also here of the Okai world, within which, as long as we follow the rules, we are shielded from the naked terrors of our condition. The Okai world provides routines and rituals through which these terrors are organized in such a way that we can face them with a, sm with a measure of calm. All rights of passage illustrate this function. The miracle of birth, the mystery of desire, the horror of death, all these are carefully camouflaged as we are led, as we are led gently over one death's world after another apparently in a natural and self-evident sequ evident sequence we are we all are born lost and must stay and thus every one of us can be protected against the unthinkable wonder of this events the man enable us to live out in inauthentically by sealing up the metaphysical questions that our existence poses we are surrounded by darkness on all sides by us as we rush through a brief span of light toward inevitable death. 
the, agon the agonized question why that almost every man feels at some moment or others or other as he becomes conscious of his condition is quickly stiff by the kitchen by the kitchy answers that that society has available society provides us with the with religious system with, with religious systems and social rituals ready made that relieve us of such questioning the world taken for granted the social world that tells us that everything is quite okay is quite is the location of of our inauthenticity let us take a man who wakes up at night from one of those night of those nightmares in which one loses all sense of identity and location even in the moment of waking the reality of one's own being and of one's world appears as a dreamlike but phantasmagorion that could vanish or be metamorphosed in the twinkling of an eye one lies in bed in a sort of metaphysical paralysis feeling oneself but one step removed from that annihilation that had looped over one in the nightmare just past. For a few moments of painfully clear consciousness one, consciousness one is at, at the point of almost smelling the slow approach of death and with it of nothingness. And then one gobs for a cigarette and, as the saying goes, comes and comes back to reality one reminds oneself of one's name, address and occupation of one's plan for the next day. One walks about one hour, one's house of, full of proofs of past and present identity. One listens to the noises of the city. Perhaps one wakes up wife or children and, and is reassured by the annoying protest. Soon, soon one can loudly dismiss the foolishness of what has just transpired, transpired, read the refrigerator for a bite of the liquor closet for the next cup, and go to sleep, and go to sleep with the determination to dream of one's next promotion. So far, so good. But what exactly is the reality to which one has just returned? It is the reality of one's sociality, socially constructed world, that okay world in which metaphysical questions are always lockable unless they have been captured and cast just treated and taken for granted religious ritualism. The truth is that this reality is a very precarious one indeed. Names, addresses, occupations, occupations and wives have a way of disappearing. All plans and is and is and in extinction. All hosts eventually become empty and even if we live we live we live all our lives without having to waste the agonizing contingency of all we we are and do in the in the end we must return that to that night to that nightmare moment when we feel ourselves stripped of all names and uh, and all identities what is more we know this we know this which makes for inauthenticity of our scurrying for shelter society gives gives us names to set us for nothingness it builds a world for us to live to live in and thus protects us from the chaos that surrounds us on all sides. It provides us with a language and with meanings that make this world believable. And it supplies a steady, a steady chorus of voices that confirm our belief and still our dormant doubts. Again, we could repeat in this slightly altered context what we have said before about bad faith. It is correct that society in its aspect of man is a conspiracy to bring about in inauthentic existence. The wall of society are a Potemkin village erected in front of the office of being. The, the fu they function to protect us from terror, to organize for us a cosmos of meaning within which our lives make sense. But this is, but is also true. The authentic existence can take place only within society. All meanings are transmitted in social process. One cannot be human, authentically or inauthentically, except in society. And the very avenues that lead to a wandering contemplation of being, be they religious or philosophical or aesthetic, have social locations. 
just associate can be applied from the freedom of an or an occasion for it. Society can bury our metaphysical case or provide forms in which it can be pursued. We come up once more on the persistency, persistently generous space paradox of our social assistance. All the same, there can be but little doubt that society functions as a libby and as Potemkin village for more than for more people than it functions for us an avenue of liberation. If we maintain the authenticity in society is possible, we are not thereby maintaining that most men are indeed making use of this possibility. Wherever we ourselves may be socially located, one look around us will tell us otherwise. With these observations, we have come, come once, once more to the edge of ethical considerations that we want to postpone for another moment. We were stressed at this point, however, that ecstasy, as we have defined it, has metaphysical as well as sociological significance. Only by stepping out of the taken for granted routines of society is, is it possible for us to confront the human condition without converting mystifications. This, not, this does not mean that only the marginal men of the rebel can be authentic. It does not mean that freedom presupposes a certain liberation of consciousness. Whatever possibilities of freedom we may have, they cannot be released if we, co if we continue to assume that the okay world of society is the only what there is. Society provides us with warm, reasonably comfortable caves in which we can huddle with our, our fellows beating on the drums that drown out they drown out the holy highness and the of the surrounding darkness. Ecstasy is the of stepping is the act of stepping outside the cage alone to face the night.